Well, thank you very much. I, I'm not going to give you any comfort in what I say, so let me start out by telling you that the message is it's now getting far too late just to reduce emissions. If we were to reduce emissions to zero tomorrow, frankly, we are cooked. There is no chance of our civilization surviving with the present amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Now, that's not a good message to give, but I am going to end what I've got to say with a strategy that could give us a manageable future. So the first point I want to make is the, the planet, we said, should not heat up beyond 1.5 degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial level. That was agreed in Paris by 195 nations. We're not at 1.1 degree above today. We're not at 1.2. We're at 1.32 degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial level today. And if we just look at what is happening now, El Nino, this effect that causes much higher temperatures as the Pacific Ocean wells up the excess heat that it's been taking up, the El Nino is with us and it's never come on so rapidly before. And we know that in the coming year, global temperatures are very likely to exceed 1.5. But where we are today is already exceptionally dangerous. And the reason is the global average temperature rise might be 1.32, but the regions of the world are all in a separate place in the sense that it's very inhomogeneous. The Arctic Circle region is what I want to focus on because the Arctic Circle region is now at three degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial level. That's the whole of the Arctic Circle annual average three degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial level. And the tipping points in the Arctic Circle region impact on the whole planet. That's my main message. So let me explain why I believe, and this is the Climate Crisis Advisory Group that I chair, which is not a UK body, it's a global body, 16 individuals from 11 different countries. The Climate Crisis Advisory Group publishes reports. I advise any of you to look at our reports and you will see that in late July 2021 we published a report giving the attribution of the extreme weather events occurring particularly around the northern hemisphere that summer. We're able to respond to situations as they're occurring and I'm going to give you that explanation now. So my I've got a few slides, they're very pictorial, and this is a schematic slide showing on the left-hand side the normal situation with a cold Arctic, and a cold Arctic is minus 10, minus 15 degrees centigrade, and a cold Arctic has very cold air above it, of course, and that cold air is kept in the Arctic Circle region by the so-called jet stream, and the jet stream is an anti-clockwise wind that blows around the North Pole region and it's delivered by the rotation of the planet. So nothing is going to change that wind. However, it can become distorted, as I'm now showing you. Imagine, as we're now seeing, that above the Arctic Circle North Pole region, the Blue Sea is exposed because the ice has been melting so rapidly that we've now got blue sea exposed. Blue sea soaks up sunshine. Ice was reflecting it back into space. The Arctic Circle region is therefore heating up very rapidly. And what we get is warm air over the North Pole region. And the warm air is then displacing the cold air down towards the south. And that causes a massive distortion in the jet stream. And it's that distortion that is causing these extreme weather events, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, but also in the Southern Hemisphere, and particularly in the Northern Hemisphere uh, summer period, the three months of the polar summer. So, you will know that in 2021, in July, August, we had this terrible heat wave along the west coast of North America, all the way up to Canada. 
in Lytton in Canada, in British Columbia, a village, a town, which is what we would all describe as middle class, we would all recognize it. 135 people died of heat stress. Why? People in Canada do not have air conditioning. They don't need it, it's cold. Right? They didn't have air conditioning. No human being can survive the temperatures they were experiencing, 49.6 degrees centigrade, for more than two or three days without air conditioning. You can be in the shade, you can get out of the sunshine, it's still too hot, you cannot get rid of your body heat and you die of heat stress. Of course, Lytton, as many of you will know, was then burnt down because the forests around the town were dried out and then began to burn and the town was destroyed in fires. But the point I'm going to make is, down the west coast, we had this jet stream locked in place, as shown here, for a good three weeks. And that locking in place meant cold air coming down Central America, being pushed by the warm air over the North Pole downwards, and then hot air from the tropics coming right up into Canada, and then getting stuck like that for a significant period of time. So the point is that the, what's happening to the jet stream is impacting on extreme weather events around the world. The weather system of the world is in transition and it's very difficult to predict where we go from here. I don't even have to emphasize here in Greece how the recent summer has been extraordinary. We've seen the biggest fire on record in Europe in, uh, in northern Greece by the Turkish border. So what, what we know is these extreme weather events literally happening around the world. But that's not all. In the Arctic Circle region we have, and on the left-hand side of this diagram, we have Greenland. And there's two miles of, of ice on Greenland. If all of that ice melts, global sea levels will rise by 7.5 meters, by 24 feet. Global average sea level temp uh, rises. Is it melting? Yes, it is now beginning to melt irreversibly year on year because of the high temperatures of the Arctic Sea that is now along one of its coastlines. It's a blue sea which wasn't there before it was covered with ice. So what we know is a real threat to every city that is on a coastline around the world. Jakarta, for example, the northern part of Jakarta is now already under seawater right round the year. So what, what we know is the massive challenge that this represents in terms of loss and damage, Bangladesh, we know, very severe. But do you know that Vietnam, by mid-century, we're now predicting 90% of the land mass of Vietnam will be under seawater at least once a year. That's the third biggest rice producer in the world. If you want to predict the future in a planet where the big rice producers, Indonesia, Southeast China, and Vietnam in that order, those big rice producers will no longer be producing rice as sea level rises because most of their paddy fields are very close to sea level. Let me take you then away from rising sea levels, which is bad enough. We certainly wouldn't be able to be having this conference here uh, with anything like that rise in sea level. Maybe I should just say, how, how rapidly will this happen? I think two or three meters by the end of the century, average sea level rise just due to what's happening in Greenland is on. And many of you will know, Antarctica is now also threatening, the West Antarctic ice sheet is also threatening to uh, break away and melt. And this is going to lead to even higher sea level rises. On the right hand side, I've already talked about the meandering of the jet stream. On the right hand side, methane emissions. Methane emissions from the permafrost region around the North Pole, where the Sami and the Inuit people have lived possibly for thousands of years. Temperature rises have been observed of 30 degrees centigrade plus over the permafrost region. 
They have been observed. They're not permanent at that high temperatures, but they certainly have been observed. And we're seeing explosive release of methane. There's no climate scientist predicted explosive release of methane, leaving great cavities in the permafrost, measuring 50 meters across, 60, 70 meters deep, methane emitted into the atmosphere. Methane is 120 times per molecule, times the, as effective as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And there's enough methane there if it was emitted over a 20-year period, global temperatures will rise by 5 to 8 degrees centigrade. Is this likely? I don't know. But is it a possibility? It certainly is. So I think if we look at sea level rises of 7 to 10 meters, if we look at global temperature rises of 5 to 8 degrees centigrade, you might see why I see this as the biggest threat our civilization has ever had to face up to. We need a strategy, and I'm just going to set up the strategy here. It's a four R strategy. The first R, yes, we have to leave fossil fuels in the ground. We must not invest further in recovery of oil, gas, and coal. We must stop their usage as quickly as we can without destroying our economies. We need to remove excess greenhouse gases. We're not at 420 parts per million. That's just carbon dioxide at methane that's already there, and we're well over 500 parts per million of greenhouse gases. What was the pre-industrial level that gave us a nice, comfortable life on this planet? 275. We've nearly doubled the amount of greenhouse gases, and frankly, that is just like putting a duvet, on, a second duvet on your bed when you're already at the right temperature. Third is repair. We have to learn how to refreeze the Arctic. And finally, we need to develop resilience. Every city in the world needs to develop resilience against the challenges I'm talking about. Thank you.